Hi, everyone. Um, this is the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs Conference. Um, the presentation will be by the Louisiana Department of Health. Um, and uh, it will be updates in coronavirus 2021. Our presenters for this um, session, which if you, you should have all received um, information in regards to um, the link to everyone's bio, which you could read. So I will not spend time reading everyone's bio, but I will let you know who will be um, on this presentation. Um, we have Julie Foster uh, Hagen, who is the Assistant Secretary for the Office for Citizens with Developmental Disabilities. And she has been in that role since July of 2018. Um, we also have Dr. Ashley Jefferson, who is currently the Senior Advisor to the Assistant Secretary. Um, she was formerly known, which was formerly known as the Chief of Staff. Um, and that is for the Office of Behavioral Health within the Department of Health. Um, and we have uh, Jana Brusor will be filling in for um, Amy Zapata and um, Jana is the um, acting director for the Louisiana Commission for the Deaf, which is in the um, Bureau of Family Health um, within our Office of Public Health. I know that's a lot of uh, meandering to go through, but uh, I know Jana will provide a lot of good information. Um, and we also have um, Dr. Fernando Lopez, which is the assistant, which he is the assistant secretary for the Office of Aging and Adult Services within the Department of Health. And I think that is everyone. And we're so glad to have this esteemed um, group with us. And we'll go ahead, I'll turn it over to you guys um, for your presentation. Thank you. Hi, this is Shanna speaking. Can you uh, move to the next slide, please? So hello, Bam, and thank you, Bambi, for that great introduction. Uh, she said, my name is Jana Broussard, and I am here presenting on behalf of the Office of Public Health Bureau of Family Health Director, Amy Zapata. I am the current interim director for the Louisiana Commission for the Deaf, which is located within the Office of Public Health. So like Bambi said, it is a, it's a lot to try to navigate through, um, but hopefully this little presentation will clarify this for you a bit. So the Office of Public Health's mission is to protect and promote the health and wellness of individuals and communities within Louisiana. And we accomplish this through education, promotion of healthy lifestyles, preventing disease and injury, enforcing regulations that protect the environment, sharing vital information and assuring preventative service to uninsured and undeserved individuals uh, and families. So within the Office of Public Health is the Bureau of Family Health. And there are two very relevant programs that are housed there. One is the programs and services for children and youth with special health care needs, and the, <clears throat> excuse me, and the other is the Louisiana Commission for the Deaf, which we will talk a little bit more about. You can go to the next slide, please. So the programs for children's uh, special health services, uh, they have specialty clinics and the parish health units uh, in different regions around the state. And there are also supportive services for children and youth with special health care needs and their families that are uh, within that program. There's also the genetic diseases program, which are health services to families who, who are who have or are at risk for genetic diseases. In addition is the Louisiana Birth Defects Monitoring Network, the Newborn Screening Program, the Early Hearing Detection Intervention Program, and the Louisiana Sickle Cell Commission. And those are all uh, under the larger umbrella of children and, um, children and youth services uh, for, that have special health care needs. Uh, so is the Louisiana Commission for the Deaf. And uh, Louisiana Commission for the Deaf provides four main programs and services. The first one is the telecommunications program. And that program provides amplified equipment and alert systems at no cost for those uh, who may be deaf, deafblind, or hard of hearing. We also have the hearing aid program. And that program provides hearing aids to uh, eligible Louisiana 
CNS seniors, there is a, um, an income qualification requirement for that program as well. We also provide uh, interpreting, it's not services, but we have an interpreting program where we oversee and uh, support communication access to state and local agencies, businesses, et cetera, in accordance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So just to clarify, for example, we can be a resource to you or your organization on how to um, uh, schedule an interpreter, uh, what, what the process may look like, what um, a deaf, a deaf, blind, or hard of hearing individual's rights may be under the Americans with Disabilities Act for communication access. However, we do not provide direct interpreting services out um, out of our um, program, but we absolutely can be a resource to you and help you uh, figure out where those agencies are and how to um, establish those accommodations if necessary. And our fourth program is our support service provider program. Now this is a direct service program and uh, we provide um, uh, regional service centers. Uh, we have regional service centers throughout the state uh, who do these direct services actually, but this program is specific for visual and auditory information support for individuals who are both deaf and deaf, um, sorry, deaf and blind. Um, that would include those who have some vision, who have some hearing. They don't have to be completely deaf and completely blind to receive these services. Um, but there are, there is a visual and a hearing uh, requirement to receive services through this program. And uh, this program empowers uh, those individuals, deafblind individuals to uh, fully participate in their communities. There are one-on-one one -on -one service providers who are trained to work with these individuals and provide that auditory and visual access for them so that they can live more independent lives. If you can go to the next slide, please. So these are some of the COVID specific changes and modifications within each program. Um, obviously when uh, COVID hit back in early 2020, um, many modifications had to be made to the programs and services that we provide. And some of these include, you can see right here on the screen um, for children and youth, uh, youth with special health care needs, there was a shift to telehealth um, within those clinics. Um, and some specialties were still offering uh, in-person clinics uh, well since July, and there is a little bit of an update on that coming on the next slide. There was also an administrative shift with parent liaisons and families helping families to ensure that the, um, that the needs were being met of the community. And then also there's a family resource center transition from on-site to uh, being a statewide virtual resource hub. And that is available now via phone or email, uh, which is actually listed right here on the slide. So some of the changes within the Louisiana Commission for the Deaf uh, were mainly uh, regarding facilitation uh, of communication access of all of the ever-changing COVID information. So if you remember uh, the daily governor press conferences, yeah, at the local level, the, you know, the constant parish updates, um, those types of things, we needed to ensure that all of this information was accessible to the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing community. Um, you probably all are very familiar with the interpreters now that you see next to the governor and other um, uh, public leaders, uh, ensuring that, that that information is accessible. So we've worked really hard to uh, support that process. And in addition, just providing support for other state and local organizations. Again, going back to how to secure accommodations, um, what, do, what does this look like in light of telehealth rules, um, you know, how to ensure accommodations are being met at testing and vaccination um, uh, sites or other related needs. Uh, in addition, we did add a COVID-19 link on our website, uh, which can be found right at the top. And that information was mainly for resource uh, um, as, a, as a resource. Um, we provided video remote interpreting guidance, again, going back to, you know, what are the rules around uh, telehealth and accommodations and how to, how to make sure an interpreter is in on a Zoom meeting, those types of things. Uh, in addition, we did create an, a communication card, which you can see right here on this um, slide, and that communication card was in collaboration with Department of Health. Um, for uh, uh, deaf uh, ASL users mainly to be able to use when they were going in for their COVID testing. And that can be found on our website. 
And we also provided links to national and local uh, information that was available in uh, American Sign Language. So, for example, the CDC actually has an entire YouTube channel full of, uh, of relevant COVID related information that has um, uh, that information in American Sign Language. So rather than reinventing the wheel, we've, we've linked a bunch of those uh, resources on our website. And if you could, yep, thank you very much. Um, so these are, this is just a little bit more information about the programs, which I was mentioning earlier. I'm actually going to pull it up on my screen so I can see it a little bit better because that one's tiny. One second. So the three, um, the three programs for children and youth with special health care needs. <clears throat> the first one is their clinical services. Um, so CSHS, which is the children's special health care services, their direct care clinics. Um, do provide services in all regions except for one in seven regions, meaning the Louisiana Department of Health regions that, uh, that you hear talked about most often with this COVID related information. Um, and those are uh, direct care clinics that are there to meet specialty care needs and provide a, uh, provider shortage areas. Um, those clinical services include genetics, single cell and subspecialty clinics. And they transitioned to mostly telehealth appointments at the beginning of COVID-19. Um, but like I said earlier, most regions have resumed in-person visits as of like yesterday. <laughs> um, however, the decisions regarding in-person visits are being made at the regional level. So for additional online information about those services, um, please go visit the Louisiana Department of Health website, which is right here on this, um, on this slide for more information. Second on the list is the resource and referral services. Uh, so the Bureau of Family Health Family Resource Center, or FRC, now functions as a statewide virtual center to ensure children and youth with special health care needs, their families, and health care providers have access to resource and referral services during the pandemic and beyond. So the Family Resource Center offers community referrals, uh, COVID-19 resources, health and education transition supports, and system navigation services for families and healthcare providers. So during the summer of 2021, so just recently, the Family Resource Center staff has piloted an outreach to families that were identified through the Louisiana Birth Defects Monitoring Network and are offering slash providing needed resource and referral services to those individuals. So the Family Resource Center, um, the staff is available to serve families and providers statewide now by telephone. And there is a, uh, well, I'll go ahead and read it to you. The number is 504-896-1340. Or there is an email, uh, which is bfh-familyresourcecenter at la.gov and you can reach them anytime between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday. And the next on the list is the Children's Special Healthcare Services Transportation Program. And this uh, transportation assistant program provided, uh, provides needed transportation assistance for eligible families of children and youth with special healthcare needs in order for them to attend medical appointments or procedures. Families must seek transportation assistance first through their MCO before requesting assistance um, through Children's Special Health Care Services. So if you're interested in any of those services, please contact the Family Resource Center or uh, your local Families Helping Family Center for more information. You can go to the next slide. So some of the program updates for the Commission for the Deaf. I see I'm almost running out of time, so I'm going to make this short and sweet. There are three main initiatives that are, are happening within the Commission for the Deaf. Uh, the first one is that um, Louisiana Commission for the Deaf has released uh, a request for information um, just recently. It's been posted on the LCD website and the Louisiana Department of Health website. And what this is, is we are searching for information related to uh, providers or organizations uh, statewide, preferably, um, we're looking for one contractor who could potentially come in and do an assessment at the Louisiana State Capitol and uh, look at their technology needs, um, their accommodations, um, uh, 
policies and procedures for requesting an interpreter, for example, um, that can come and just uh, do um, an innovative, uh, well, research and, and provide some innovative solutions to the legislator um, to ensure um, uh, accommodations for legislative session. Uh, our main focus at this point is the technology upgrades that need to happen within the, um, the Capitol to provide things such as like closed and or open captioning. Um, so if you uh, have any questions about that or want more information, please go to the Louisiana Commission for the Deaf website and you can see, uh, you can read the full request for information uh, there. Next on the list is that uh, Louisiana Commission for the Deaf has contracted with an organization to provide medical best practices for communication uh, with those who are deaf, deaf, blind, or hard of hearing. So during the uh, House Committee re Resolution, HCR 80, of the 2019 regular legislative session, uh, there was a study committee that addressed um, communication needs, patient-centered communication needs in the medical settings. And uh, one of the recommendations, number two specifically, that came out of that study committee was that Louisiana Department of Health needed to partner with the commission uh, to provide um, some best practices and guidelines for medical providers. And so we have contracted uh, uh, with an, age, uh, an organization and we are going through the contract process right now to get it approved. Um, but we'll be moving forward with that very shortly uh, and hope by this time next year, if not sooner, that we will have um, a very formal best practices guidelines uh, for communicating with those uh, who have you know, specific communication needs in healthcare um, settings. So uh, to include nursing homes, hospitals, et cetera. And the next one on the list is our support service provider program, which I just mentioned, uh, which is our per, um, program for uh, deafblind individuals, is moving to uh, an RFP or request for a proposal. So that program uh, is now going into competitive bid, and we are going to be collecting, um, and we are going, we are requesting <laughs> um, proposals for organizations who potentially can uh, provide the needed services for um, the community for deafblind individuals. Um, so uh, they will also be responsible for the training of, of the one-on-one -on -one, um, providers who do work with these individuals, um, coordinating the provision of high quality services through the program and, and, being, uh, and informing the continued development and improvement of the program in collaboration with the Commission for the Deaf. So that RFP should be um, published where we're waiting on final approval and we hope for it to be um, to be published any day now. Again, please feel free to reach out to the commission if you have any questions regarding that. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And just as a little bit of a summarized version, some of the priorities for the Office of Public Health, um, these, a lot of these uh, priorities are found within the Bureau of Family Health, um, primarily just because of, of the, the programs and services that are offered there. Um, so going back to the Louisiana Commission for the Deaf, we do have uh, a new mission, vision, and values that was just voted on by the commission and um, we did uh, community um, surveys and focus groups to um, collect da data and research on helping inform our strategic plan over the next three years. And so that is our main focus is to launch that strategic plan. And that is also going to include modernizing our laws and rules, which were written uh, back in 1980. And a lot of uh, things have changed since then. Um, in addition is just the continuing work uh, surrounding uh, the modernization of our current programs and services, and also a shift into not only providing programs and services, but um, a, a desire to become more of a resource center and um, kind of a hub, so to speak, for organizations to help systems do the right thing. And so what we've noticed in our work is that oftentimes people want to do the right thing, they just don't know what that right thing is, and they don't necessarily know how to achieve it. And so we have made um, it a priority to shift some of our focus on informing, supporting, um, and educating uh, systems on how to uh, ensure that the services provided for deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing are being met. And we just wanted to say many thanks to our um, past and current legislative champions that have been working tirelessly to see these initi initiatives um, move and, and, and have strong language um, to be able to ensure that they are successful. 
Uh, in addition, uh, um, BFH and OPH's priorities include bringing Louisiana's newborn screening uh, system current with national recommendations. Also bringing Louisiana's birthing facilities current using national recommendations. And I'm probably speaking way too fast for the interpreter. I apologize, I should know better. <laughs> Also advancing important priorities for the children's health in Louisiana Department of Health's business plan. And that includes developmental of screening best practices and also the families helping families focus on the children um, and youth with special health care needs. They're also committed to continuing to champion, champion work related to adverse childhood experiences, which includes trauma informed systems and resiliency. And then lastly, the State Health Assessment for Public Health Accreditation. Uh, so as I stated at the very beginning, I am presenting for uh, the Bureau of Family Health Director, Amy Zapata. So I don't have a whole lot of information on some of those last ones, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm not sure if we're holding them till the very end. Um, but if you do go to the next slide is our contact information. So we have Amy Zapata, which is the Director of the Bureau of Family Health um, and uh, there it is. And so that's her, uh, her email. And then Patty, I can never say her last name, Vero Vecchio, I think, forgive me, Patty. <laughs> uh, and she is the uh, statewide RN consultant for the Bureau of Family Health. And so she's over uh, overseeing that children and youth with uh, special health care needs. That, that's who you would need to contact. And then here is my information with the Louisiana Commission for the Deaf. So feel free to uh, let us know if you have any follow-up questions or need additional information, we'd be happy to share. I do believe, okay, Office of Bureau of, uh, Office of Behavioral Health is next. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as the team mentioned earlier, my name is Dr. Ashley Jefferson, and I am going to be presenting on behalf of the Office of Behavioral Health. So um, what the Office of Behavioral Health does is it manages and delivers the services and the supports that are necessary to improve the quality of life of citizens with mental illness and or addictive disorders. Um, we are a part, of course, of the LDH team. And so the LDH mission is also our mission. We do have our very own specific mission, but for purposes of this um, presentation, I just want to kind of focus on the LDH, LDH mission, which is to promote the health of all of Louisiana citizens. Um, we also act as monitors and subject matter consultants for several of the programs, but specifically the Children's Coordinated System of Care Program, which is also known as CSOC, and the Medicaid Health of Louisiana Managed Care Plans, or MCOs, that manage the behavioral health services. Um, we do have a component of our uh, agency that delivers direct care through hospitalization, um, and they have oversight over behavioral health community-based treatment programs through the Human Services Districts and Authorities, also known as the LGE. Next slide, please. All right, so our services design um, is, I've set it up to show that it is kind of um, go by populations, but for, um, for, for lack of a better phrase, we pretty much have something for everyone, right? Um, Can you all hear me? It's saying that my line is muted. We can hear you now. All right, thanks. So um, we have we have programming and services and can offer consultation to individuals and families that includes children, um, adolescents, and adults. Um, we have program programming surrounding gambling, um, substance use such as tobacco, opioids but we have a lot of very specific things in these um, three areas in terms of prevention, wellness, and um, treatment. Um, we also have some targeted grants 
toward pregnant women and women with dependent children. And um, as I noted earlier, we have services for individuals who need forensic um, related care. Next slide, please. So wanted to highlight some of what we know and what we're doing at OBH. Um, we are definitely acknowledging and identifying and addressing issues um, in terms of health equity. We understand that that is a, um, a major area where we need to be focused on, and we are following the lead of um, our leadership at LDH and making sure that um, health equity um, disparities, all of those things are acknowledged and addressed, and we're continually and actively working towards decreasing those things. Um, we do know that many people with mental illness, whether it's diagnosed or undiagnosed, face difficulties in daily living. And so that's a priority for us also. Um, we understand that individuals with serious mental illness or SMI are likely to have um, other difficulties that someone without these conditions may or may not have. And so we're very aware of that. Um, and, and we know that the research says that the services are often underutilized by um, specific populations and the population where um, behavioral health issues exist is not um, exempt from that either. Next slide, please. So just to go over a couple of things, I've listed out some of these things about our program and initiatives, and I've talked about it before. But um, the things that are highlighted in blue are of particular importance, I think, too, for some of our updates. So um, our emergency preparedness and disaster response is um, very important because currently the Office of Behavioral Health has two programs that are ongoing that have been due to um, the pandemic and weather-related initiatives. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, in terms of adolescents and adults, our employment initiatives are really, um, we're really proud of those. So we have worked very closely with um, the, with GOTA and um, the Louisiana Rehabilitation Services under the Louisiana Workforce Commission. We've also worked um, closely with the Office of Disability Employment Policy and um, GOTA and LRS to make sure that we are um, increasing and enhancing our collaboration and our efforts to make sure that we bring employment to the state of Louisiana, but that it is also inclusive of the behavioral health population. So something specific that the Office of Behavioral Health is doing is that we are actively engaging in planning and researching and um, ways to implement evidence-based practices as, as they pertain to employment. So one of the ones that we are actively looking at and actively being trained on um, is the IPS model, which is a supported employment model that um, is specifically for individuals who have behavioral health needs. And as information becomes available and we progress in that area, I will continue to report out on that um, to GATA and GOTA. Um, OBH is also currently hiring a supported employment specialist. We're in that process. So to, um, to support these employment initiatives, we're actually um, currently in the process of interviewing um, and selecting someone who would be a great fit for that um, position so that we can have our um, support and employment work continue. The other thing that I was just wanting to mention briefly is our crisis, crisis system of care initiatives. We have a lot of those initiatives actually going on and um, we'll, there will be much more in the future, but just wanting people to know that these are things that are actually happening and we will be, we will continue to report out on those as they come. Next slide, please. All right, so these are our Medicaid covered services and they're the, these are the specialized behavioral health services. As you can see, there are a good bit, but I wanted to make sure that people had this information available to them. Um, and then that there's a bullet at the bottom that says peer support services coming soon. 
actually they um this year a couple of months ago we actually um have the peer support services being reimbursed through Medicaid. So there's a lot of information about that. And you can find out about that on our website or feel free to reach out to me. I won't go through all of these for the sake of time. So next slide, please. All right, so I was saying a little bit earlier about our COVID and weather event related responses and how I'll come back and talk a little bit more about some of those things. So our telehealth allowances that um, and, and the specialized behavioral health flexibilities that came into play when the pandemic began um, are actually still ongoing. Um, we there are a couple that um, there were a few changes to, but for the most part, these things are still occurring. I also want to be very clear and say that in the state of Louisiana, we already have some telehealth allowances that are in law. So um, even post pandemic, these flexi these these this telehealth service is going to be here. It just may not be um, there may not be certain things that you can do that you can do now due to COVID. Um, so we have some COVID specific grants. Um, the crisis counseling program is one that I really want to talk about. Um, it's, we have a lot of COVID work going on, but in terms of our crisis counseling program, the Louisiana Spirit Crisis Counseling Program is a disaster recovery program that operates only if the state is eligible for individual assistance after a presidentially declared disaster. As you know, we've had several of those in the past year, uh, 18 months. Um, and in Louisiana, this is very important about the crisis counseling program because this program actually works um, whenever we have any type of disaster. And so when we have the hurricanes and the flooding, this program gets up and running and they actually um, go out and provide services to the community and to uh, the citizens. So as I said, we have two actually going right now. We have the COVID-19 crisis counseling program and those services are available statewide and in partnership with LGEs or human services districts. And we have the Hurricane Laura crisis counseling program. Um, and those services are offered at the state level in specific regions, but those regions that were hardest um, affected, most affected by the Hurricane Laura weather event. And that, those are regions four, five, six, seven, and eight. Next slide, please. All right, so um, you just saw a picture on the last slide, but I also have a slide that talks about a lot of the immediate resources that we have in terms of behavioral health. Um, this can be found on our website too, or I can send it to you. You can reach out to me directly or to whomever and I can get it to you. But one is to highlight that we um, actually stood up the Keep Calm line at the beginning of COVID and it is still ongoing. It was formerly the Keeping Calm Through COVID line, but now it is just the Keep Calm line. It's been um, renamed because it is a line that is open for everyone. It is free, um, confidential, and staffed by professionals. The Behavioral Recovery Outreach line is also a warm line that came um, out of the pandemic. Um, but what we are doing is we're seeing that these lines are really assisting and helping people. And so we want to make sure that we're putting this information out there and keeping it up. Um, next slide, please. All right, so for more information, here's just a resource page, but I just wanted to let everyone know, feel free to look at these websites. And if you can't remember them um, or remember these links, feel free to reach out to me and I'll get that information to you. Next slide. All right, and so feel, like I said, feel free to reach out to me. That My name is Ashley Jefferson, but our um, OBH Assistant Secretary, Ms. Karen Stubbs Church, um, is, is she's out right now currently, but um, feel free to reach out to her if you need anything um, as well. So thanks, and I'll let the next person go. Good afternoon, this is Dr. Lopez Evangelio from the Office of Aging and Adult Services. I'm the Assistant Secretary. I'm gonna share with you some of the highlights of our functions and our accomplishments uh, recently. And 
uh, for the sake of time, I will not be going over every single detail on these slides, as I'm sure that there will be some method um, for you to access these. Now, what we do at OAAS is provide programmatic leadership and oversight for older adults and persons with adult onset disability. Uh, these programs include home and community-based waivers, state plan long-term personal care services, and pay center. Additionally, medical eligibility determinations for individuals requesting nursing facility admissions. The Villa Feliciana Medical Complex is also under our purview nursing facility transition services and other programs like adult protective services and um, permanent, the very successful permanent supportive housing program. We can take the next slide then now, please. Uh, the OAS Community Choices Waiver offers a variety of community-based services like in-home personal care attendance services, adult day health care, home modifications, assisted devices, MIHC, and permanent supported housings. And some of these we might be able to um, get into a little bit more detail as we continue on with our slides. And I'll be asking for the next one. Thank you, please. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> OAS has worked uh, intensely and extensively to reduce uh, the notorious wait list for our community choices waivers. We are proud that as of June 30 um, of this year, our wait list, which are the individuals on the registry who are not receiving other HCBS services has been reduced um, by half, basically down to 5,853. Uh, on the table, you can see the enrollment latest figures as of June 30, 2021. 5,000 almost for community choice waivers, ADHC waivers at 449, PACE participants at 426, and long-term personal care services at almost 10,000. Next slide, please. Now, in response uh, to COVID-19, the Office of Aging and Adult Services has implemented multiple alternatives uh, to the methods of delivery of services. Uh, adult day health care uh, and pay centers, uh, as you know, had to be closed. Um, but retainer payments and time limited retroactive rate increases were made to, to HDXCs, and a per diem structure was created to allow the ADHC to perform wellness checks on participants. HDHC and PACE now have the option to open with the use of distancing and masking guidelines. Per diem wellness check structure remains uh, in place as well. So ADHCs can do um, both things. They can have participants attend and also perform well checks on days the participants cannot attend choose not to attend. We'll go to the next slide now. Uh, in terms of specific changes and modifications, additional exceptions include implementing flexibilities such as allowing the participant to live with the direct support worker, allowing verbal agreements or electronic signatures, um, implementing hazard pay to workers under LTPCS or PAS, and allowing virtual visits in lieu of face-to-face -face visits, among several others. So these are some of the ones that um, are more worthy of mentioning and highlighting. And in the next slide, we will see some of the highlights of the COVID rates among the HCBS populations. The key or the point on this chart is that second column uh, to the left, um, positive COVID-19 cases. Now note that only 6.4% of the OAAS, ADHC, and community choice waivers and PACE population has been identified as COVID positive, where the general population percentage is around 11%. 
of those who have tested positive um, for, for COVID. Given the fact that um, these are populations that live um, or participate often in integrated uh, environments, uh, the very low percentage, as well as the rest of the percentage that are presented in this table, show you that um, we have been successfully maintaining very, very, very low percentages of adverse uh, exposures and effects of the COVID-19 virus. I would like to then leave you with the contact information on our next slide. Um, and I want to highlight Elizabeth Atkins, um, uh, who was my who is my senior advisor um, after the title change from chief of staff, um, has now been detailed uh, to the role of the deputy assistant secretary following our dear Robin Wagner's retirement, which was effective um, last uh, July 23rd. And um, we wish Elizabeth a lot of luck, and we know that she will be very, very successful. Her contact information is there. She can reach out and help me help you. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, we'll be taking the next participant. Hi, everyone. Uh, Julie Foster Hagen with the Office for Citizens with Developmental Disabilities. And I will be covering some information for my office as well as some information on the, on the Medicaid section and, and where you can go for questions there. So just a high level overview of what we do in the Office for Citizens with Developmental Disabilities. We have four home and community-based waivers, the New Opportunities Waiver, the Residential Options Waiver, Children's Choice Waiver, and Supports Waiver. The Early Steps Program, which is Louisiana's early intervention program for children birth to three with developmental delays is under our office. We also have an OCDD Resource Center um, and state funded services that are operated through our local governing entities. We do have uh, oversight of intermediate care facilities for individuals with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities we work collaboratively with 10 local governing entities. You may also hear them called districts and authorities um, who are our single point of entry into our developmental disability system. And we do have two state operated facilities under our office, Pinecrest Supports and Services Center and Central Louisiana Supports and Services Center, both in the Alexandria Pineville area and um, Central Louisiana Supports and Services Center used to be known as the Louisiana Special Education Center. Some folks still refer to that. Next slide. I won't read all of these to you, but just wanna give you guys an idea. When we say home and community-based waiver services, the most often used service that people use in our waivers are in-home um, personal care attendants or direct support workers who just help them um, manage their day or whatever is needed throughout the day. But we also have a large array of other services that can be used to really help people have meaningful and independent lives. Things like employment services and other types of therapy that can really help and focus on folks being independent. And we like to encourage uh, folks to utilize all available services in the home and community-based waivers. Okay, next slide. Um, to give you guys um, some information about some of the COVID-specific changes and modifications that, um, that we made uh, during the emergency, similar to what our Office of Aging and Adult Services provided um, we did uh, allow several, uh, several different exceptions. And where we are in the process now, and I apologize because it looks like one of our slides uh, must have not got added and we didn't catch it. Um, one of the, what, where we are now is really taking a look at um, after the public health emergency has ended, 
um, what are things that we will be able to continue um, and things that we will have to discontinue after the public health emergency. We have held listening sessions to hear from families and we know that a lot of families would like to see some of these exceptions um, continue. So we are looking specifically at in which circumstances family members may be able to continue to be paid caregivers. Um, and our regulations, the federal regulations require that we keep, we, we follow certain guidelines there. So we won't be able to continue it as it currently is during COVID, but there will be some times and some exceptions that we'll be able to have in place that will under certain circumstances allow family members to be paid caregivers. Um, and we are also looking at the use of technology and virtual visits and using what we learned during COVID that really helped families to be able to look at what are long-term changes that we may be able to make, including things like virtual day habilitation um, for people who maybe are never comfortable going back into a day program or a facility. Um, we do currently have um, our new opportunities waiver, uh, which is up for renewal. It is posted for public comment, which you can find on our OCDD website. And you will see some of these changes have been incorporated into our new opportunities waiver renewal. I'll also let you guys know that um, the, the data that OAAS shared with you, that was great data. Uh, I think we had a comment there. Um, we do include updates to for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities related to COVID positivity. Um, and we do update those. At this time, we update it monthly um, and so you can find information there. We also know as, you know, over the weekend, um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard our COVID uh, rates are starting to rise again across Louisiana. So we don't have it kind of hot and fresh off the press for the conference today, but I will just say that folks, please pay close attention. We do anticipate some updated guidance coming from the department in relation to mask updates, social distancing, and some of those things as it relates to our recent significant increases in the number of people who are COVID positive. Okay. The next slide will provide you with our OCDD contact information. Again, my name is Julie Hagen and my contact information is julie.hagen at la.gov. And we've also provided you with some links. Um, oftentimes we're asked and we will be sharing uh, with um, Bambi and those folks the uh, these PowerPoint slides because we have a lot of kind of links and contact information. So we'll be sharing that. Okay, the next slide. To provide you guys with an overview of a uh, Medicaid um, Medicaid um, operates, Medicaid has uh, several different functions, including Medicaid eligibility determinations. So there are many different programs within Medicaid and the eligibility has to determine if you're eligible for each of those different programs. So there's a whole section related to that. There is a section in Medicaid that works on uh, provider payments. So payments for services that are provided to our folks. Um, there is oversight of managed care plans. There is also oversight of our Medicaid services. And then in partnership with the, our program offices, they ad help administer our home and community-based waivers that we have across all of our uh, program offices. So again, our Medicaid section works in collaboration with our program offices to be able to support persons with disabilities and seniors across our state, okay? So here's again, some information to links of information. We do keep a, a, a coronavirus Medicaid information site uh, that we keep updated that gives ongoing guidance 
uh, for all uh, members. Uh, so the member portal are those folks who are Medicaid eligible, and then a provider portal that includes all of the guidance for providers of Medicaid services. Okay, next slide. So during COVID, um, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, um, we did receive additional federal funding from the, or to support, uh, you know, our persons with disabilities and our elders, but it required that we had continuous eligibility throughout the public health emergency, which means that only under, that, that people who were Medicaid eligible at the time of the public health emergency needed to be able to maintain their eligibility for Medicaid. So since March of 2020, the only reason someone would lose coverage, Medicaid coverage, was if they passed away, if they moved out of state, or if they asked to be able to be closed. Um, so we've had to, to be able to maintain that in order to keep our federal funding. Services, COVID specific services through Medicaid include vaccination administration, um, COVID testing. We have had under our early periodic screening and diagnostic treatment, which is most folks know as EPSDT, we have had some modifications to those in-home personal care services. We've made modifications in Medicaid to our home health authorizations and our pediatric day health services or health centers. We've also done it within Medicaid, they've done all they can to have the maximum telehealth flexibilities. So for people to not have to go in person and keep them safe, we've had um, our telehealth flexibilities and then the waiver modifications that, that we shared with you guys earlier. Okay, next slide. We are beginning um, within all of Medicaid, I mentioned for OCDD, but within all of Medicaid, we're starting to look at what happens after the public health emergency. We do know that in July, uh, the Biden administration extended the public health emergency for another 90 day period. They can only extend those for 90 days at a time. So we would anticipate then in October looking for another extension. They have told us that they plan to extend it at least through the end of this calendar year. But again, we'll have to see in October if they extend for another 90 day period. But what we've started to do or what they've started to do within Medicaid is to take a look at those people who would have lost Medicaid coverage during the public health emergency and to start sending out notifications to those folks so that they can be aware that when the public health emergency ends, they will lose Medicaid eligibility so that they can begin preparing um, for what they may need to uh, um, if they get, um, if, if they in fact will be closed. The letter that they will receive will provide them with where they can go if they have questions about the, the notification. Okay, next slide. And um, for the Medicaid program supports and waiver, um, Brian Bennett is the uh, point of contact there. And we'll get that corrected before we send that out. It's brian.bennett at la.gov. And Kelly Zimmerman is the Deputy Medicaid Director over Policy Waiver and Public Affairs. Okay, next slide. This slide just provides everyone with uh, all of the contact information for all of the presenters that you had today, um, should you have questions. And it does look like we have about five minutes left. Bambi, I don't know if you guys have a way for folks to enter a chat or Q&A or uh, if there's any clarification that, that you guys might have that we want to uh, give in the in the last five minutes. Uh -huh. Thank you, Julie, and thank you to all the presenters. We did have one question um, from YouTube, and if anyone else has a question, you can type it really quick. Um, and this is from um, Kathy to, um, regarding behavioral health services. Um, has any of the behavioral health services that were cut under the previous administration been restored, especially the community programs? So um, without having a little more um, pointed um, 
information in the question about which specific programs the um, individual is asking about. I can say that we do have a lot of programming that is occurring at the community level through the LDEs, through our behavioral health providers in the community, and also um, from the, um, like I said, Office of Behavioral Health um, perspective. So we have the crisis counseling program, which is actually ongoing statewide. And as I said earlier, that it is the Hurricane Laura CCP, or crisis counseling program, is um, targeted to um, regions four, five, six, seven, and eight. However, the COVID-19 um, crisis counseling program is statewide and, and anyone is eligible to participate. So if you need more information about that, feel free to email me. I can send you that information and direct you where to go where you can find more information. But also if you want to email me, um, I can also I can help find any type of community programming that is specific to what you're talking about because I'm sure um, that there is a lot of that um, out there and, and maybe it just may be that some people just don't know about it and that's fine. That's what we're here to do. Our next question is also from YouTube. Um, can a person receiving waiver service require their DSW to wear a mask? So this is Julie, I'll take a shot at that. I, I would say yes. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions about vaccinations and vaccinations sometimes gets a little tricky. Um, uh, you can ask about vaccinations. My understanding is that you can ask about vaccinations, but you can't mandate or require that someone provide you with that information. But by all means, if you are receiving services and you would feel more comfortable with your worker wearing a mask, absolutely, uh, you can ask that person uh, to wear a mask. And the new updates that are coming out, at, you know, kind of as we at yesterday and today are that all everyone mask and social distance, regardless of if you've been vaccinated or unvaccinated at this point. So we would encourage folks to do that. And then, you know, I, I meant to say this and I forgot at the very end. So just one more plug, please, 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 if you have not been vaccinated yet, do continue. The, the only way we're gonna get out of this is if we can get more people in Louisiana um, comfortable and understanding why we need to, but we definitely need to, to, to try to help folks understand and be comfortable with um, getting vaccinated so that we can, um, we can beat this. I'm Dr. Lopez again, I echo uh, Julie. Uh, my answer would also be yes. A DSW participant may ask, uh, and it's probably a good idea to do so for the DSW um, worker to wear a mask um, and also engage in all the other precautions such as social distances and hand washing and hand sanitizing and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, Dr. Lopez. I don't see any other um, questions. Um, this PowerPoint was filled with information. Just want to let everyone know that we will share um, all the PowerPoints from the presentations we receive, including this one, um, at the end of the conference. Um, so you, if you have registered, you will receive um, a copy of that uh, presentation. Um, just want to thank the uh, Department of Health for sharing that information. That was a lot of information to, to fit into an hour. And um, we really appreciate the partnership um, and particularly those of you who are presenters and, and those people that work closest with you have been such um, good partners um, with our disability community and trying to um, serve our community um, so well. So we really appreciate it. So thank you guys. And um, just wanna remind everyone, we have our last session of today um, at 3.30. Um, and you can stay logged in here. We would ask you if you're not a presenter, if you could switch over to YouTube um, because we do have limited capacity within Zoom um, for people uh, to be um, logged into Zoom, but you can watch it on uh, this whole conference on YouTube and make comments there. 
And we are only three sessions into 18 sessions, and this has been great. We appreciate everybody's participation, and all this wonderful information, and looking forward to a great week. So um, with that, we will see you all at um, 3.30 for um, our presentation, which will be interactions with law enforcement. So thank you guys.